Today I have with me author, actress, writer, everything, <laughs> uh, model Donna Russo Morin, and her latest book is The Competition. And I am so happy you said yes. I did not think you were going to say yes to me, Donna. Really? I did not. I, you know, some people I just ask and I'm like, whatever. Because I, I look at you as being like too out there already, you know, like. <laughs> oh, I'm just a regular person that just happens to write books and do a few other interesting things. Well, after reading your books, I think that you are like one of the smartest people I know now. Oh my goodness. I'm, I'm not sure if I would go that way. Maybe I'm just really good at research. You, I think my research is, my research skills have made a big difference in the quality of my work. Yeah, yeah. and um, well, let, let's start at the beginning because I have so sure. many questions. So you started out young, you were an actress and you've been in The Departed and you've been yep. in The Brotherhood. I never heard of The Brotherhood. Yeah, it was a three season series on Showtime. Hmm. Back, going back when it was just HBO, Showtime, and Cinemax, I oh, think, were the first okay. cable shows. But it stars, um, I'm such a Harry Potter freak, Draco, Draco Malfoy's father in <sighs> Harry Potter. Nice. It starred him and, and um, the man who did the torture in that great movie, Zero Dark Thirty. When they got Osama bin Laden. Yeah. That guy. So they were the two brothers um, in this series. And it was basically about the mob. Um, right. Rhode Island has always had, in the past, um, a bit of a mob background. Little Italy, Federal Hill, where I was born. Um, interesting. Yeah. So it was interesting to do that experience, but um, I couldn't watch it myself. It was too violent for me. So <laughs> and I, was thinking, I never really got to see myself. My yeah, kids would yell, you're on, and I'm like, okay, good, whatever. I'm I was fine. thinking, like, <laughs> it would have just been so easy for you to just go do that, go be an actress, and, and, you know, you had all these great ties, and then you become an author. Like, what made you decide to, like, and you've been a model, I mean, to, like, leave that behind and do the hard thing, what I consider the hard thing. <laughs> <laughs> to be truthful... The writing came first. I started writing very, very young. Um, and my father wanted me to get a real job and a real degree and all that kind of stuff. And in my senior year of high school, I was walking through my local, I mean, it's that ridiculous story. I was walking through Sears in the mall and a guy from Sears stopped me and said are you a model and I said no I'm not and he said would you like to be and I said I'm going to call the police and he <laughs> said no no <laughs> don't do that I'm serious and he took me back into the executive offices and the next thing I know I'm sitting in a classroom still in high school teachers wheeling in the television and we're all waiting and boom there I was but I ended up using it as a way to pay for my three degrees wow. at college. At one point, I did think, okay, I'm going to try and take this modeling for all its worth. And I went to New York and I had someone at Ford Modeling Agency tell me if I had was three inches taller, I could have been the next supermodel. So after hearing that, it was such a letdown. You're like, okay, I'll go do that. <laughs> yes. You know, at 21, I'm just going to grow another three inches. Um, it was such a letdown that I kind of let it go, but I've continued on doing local commercials, and uh, they film a lot of films in Boston, and that's how I got in The Departed and on Showtime's Brotherhood. So still doing it. Just for the fun of it. Right. And that's awesome. And, you know, The Departed, like, there were big stars in The Departed. There were huge stars. I, mean, I didn't and... realize it because I looked it up last night and, you know, I watched it back in the day and then I looked it right. up again and I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize how many stars were in that movie. Like, it was just yeah, jam-packed. Incredible. <laughs> First off, it's Martin Scorsese. Right. So 
he sits under a tent with a monitor for every camera. And whenever he wants things to change, there's an assistant director assigned to each camera. And he'll give them directions to go out and give the actors. So, but he deals with the big stars himself. So my assistant director, so it's that scene where Martin Scorsese's running to meet Leonardo DiCaprio on top of the rooftop. And so I'm passing, uh, not Martin Scorsese, Martin Sheen. Yeah. yeah. Martin Sheen. Yeah. 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 And so my AD said, Mr. Scorsese would like you to bump into Martin Sheen. And I said, okay, I can do that. But Mr. Scorsese told Martin Sheen the same thing. So when action hit, we both went in too hard. And I'm kind of a little person. And he literally knocked me on my ass on the streets of Boston. (laughs) And he felt so bad. And he's picking me up. And then he starts wiping the back of my skirt. He's like, I'm so sorry I knocked you down. And then he's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry I'm wiping your ass. (laughs) It's just one of my favorite stories from that line of my life. It was just, and we both just started laughing, and it was great. It was great. Yeah, what a great story! I love that. It's a great memory. It it really is. And just like to be on a set, like I said, of something that big is crazy. You know, it is crazy. Because I started because it's like okay, Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Sheen and Alec Baldwin and uh, Matt Damon, and you know, it's like you just. It was phenomenal. Yeah. No really wonder that was. movie did so well, you know? Like, how could it not, you know? How could it not? And it was a brilliant script, too. Yeah. It really so, was. Well, so, you know, then back to, okay, so you could have done that. I could have. I could have, yes. But it was right around that time that I um, started having my children. And I guess so that, that that's not, yeah, I guess that's a difficult transition to make. Because, it's a very difficult transition, yeah. Yeah. If I, I had, had just gone for the acting rather than the modeling, I would have had to go to L.A. Yeah. Uproot infants, you know, it's not, it's not the easiest thing. And, and um, my first love has always been writing, and I just thought, okay. That's where you're supposed to be. All the signs are leading you there, so just go there. Well, and I have to tell you, I'm happy you made that choice. Okay? <laughs> Thank because you. Your Thank books, you. Right, and I read, okay, I read the first one, The Competition, so everybody can right. say this again. This is the second one of the division. Second. And, yep, and I read the first one on my Kindle, um, and I listened to the audiobook too. So I was kind of doing that, and then I went to, you know, and then I read that, because I'm like that kind of weird reader. Like, I can't just read the second book. <laughs> you know, no, no. And although but you could have. You could have because you did it so well. I didn't need to read the first book. Your second no. book was definitely, it, it can be standalone. But I like to know more. I'm a like knowing more person. You know, I don't like to be like, right. you know, I want to know where these characters came from. So right. I, I'm listening I, to it. And I'm I, like, develop, I developed the whole trilogy so that each book had its own beginning and ending plot arc but the lives of the women are arced over the three books right so So when you read them all together then you really get the lives of these women women and the historical events that they live through become secondary because then you see it in totality their lives in totality well, who did you was. get to do? Did you do the audio book or did you have somebody do that for you? No, um, Audible hired. They oh hire. Gosh. Have you listened to that? It is crazy. It is crazy good. <laughs> it is crazy good. The problem, though, is I hear voices in my head. My characters speak to me. Right. And so, and I won't say which ones or anything because I don't want to ruin it for anybody who may. But there were certain characters where I didn't like her intonation yeah. of their voice. And so I started to listen to it, and then I said, yeah, it's not working for me. That's just going to bother me all the way through. So I stopped listening. Yeah, well, in those Audible, I mean, I listened to a lot of audiobooks, And mm-hmm. what I loved about her was that um, her um, dialect 
I should say her Italian. Her Italian, yeah. The way she spoke it, perfect, was really perfect. cool because I really got into there, and that's what right. Audible. You know, that's what's great about Audible uh, books, and I always tell authors they should do those because I listen to a lot of audio books, and it does take you to another level. Sometimes I like to open the book up, sometimes I like to listen, but for these kind of books, the listening is a yeah. different experience when you're going into a different country and you have to kind of like absolutely, I agree. Like yeah, that. no, I did notice that her her diction, her Italian diction, was perfect. Yeah, really, really perfect. She did it very well. So, so when I'm reading, you know, I'm listening and then I'm reading and, and I was like, oh my God, your knowledge, like I love historical fiction. Okay. <laughs> and I'm on a, you know, right now I've been interviewing historical fiction authors like crazy. Right. So I'm all over the place on, you know, in history, but to take on, okay. It's one thing to take on world war two historical <laughs> fiction. Okay. There's a lot out there. You can oh. research really well. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to dig too hard. But right. to go back to 1400s in Italy, yeah. in Florence. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was just no Facebook and there was just no. Delivery. No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's what I teach when I teach. Cause I teach is writing historical fiction. And that's exactly what I say is there was no Facebook Instagram, Twitter to document every movement of a person's life. So it's up to us as historical novelists to dig that good stuff up and to and, put it on page. Exactly. And I've never read one about Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. And now I feel like, and what I love about historical fiction is that I have a, a different perspective of what you learn about it. You know, now he is a person. Right with opinions and right you know, and you almost have just one of the most iconic people to have ever lived exactly and yet yeah. to see him like talking i mean to, to read him talking to women you know and picturing that in my brain and you know i was right. that's why i said like okay first of all i have to show people the beginning of this because the map <laughs> is just crazy I, and i use this map Okay, but I am Good. so happy that you not only did the map, but you did also the characters. And yes. and because when I read historical fiction, I'm always wondering who, which one Who's is real. Me? And you right. made that very easy because then it was like, oh, okay. So I, because I don't know my 1400. <laughs> <laughs> well. No, most people don't, especially <laughs> Italian fourteen hundred right, living like, in America. Okay, I know about the Medici family. I got I got a little right. working knowledge, but to yeah. to who's related to who and who's real and who's not. Right. That was I am so happy that you are one of those authors that does that because I did even when I was listening to the the first book, I had it on my Kindle of the people, so I kept referring so to So you it. kept looking them up. Good. Well, because That's I'm, great. Italian is not my natural, so the, some of the names you know, I had to look up. In and of themselves are difficult. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. you, like, you did a brilliant job. I mean, I, I, oh, thank I, you I so much. Say Can you call me and say that all at once a day? And 7 a.m. Donna, you're awesome. Just remember that. You're writing today. Get up and go right. <laughs> Get up and go right. Well, okay. So, what made you? I mean, obviously, you're Italian, right? Yes. Second okay. generation, full Italian. All my grandparents came <laughs> here. On the boat through Ellis Island. Yes. And you actually yeah. see, I talked to another woman who was Italian. She was from Jersey, though. And she only traced the one side. But you know that all four, oh. like, you know that. Yes. That is crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a gift to know, I, you know? It is a gift to know, yes. And, and you know, America is um, the country of mutts and mongrels, you know, um, and so to be pure blood in 2000, it's still very rare. It's very rare. It's getting more rare all of the course, time. Of course. So where did they come from in Italy? Were you, were they from like all one place or? No, 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 no. Um, my paternal grand father was in Foggia, which is on the cliffs of the East Coast. Um, latitude about the same as Rome. Mm -hmm. um, his wife was from Naples. And, and my mother's parents were both from Umbria in the Tuscany region, Perugia. 
Awesome. You know, my daughter went to Italy for a month last year. She's 22 and she didn't want to come home. And she talks about it nonstop. She always says, I want to go back. And I'm like, don't you want to go to another country? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> she, she traveled the whole country and she's like, I just want to go back and do exactly what I did and eat what I ate. And she's like, there's no food better. There's no place better. There's no, you know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, something. So it's crazy. Okay, so then you have that heritage. So then it's, e you know, it makes it like, it gives it more depth for when you're writing, like you're actually writing, you know, about these people back in the 1400s that, right. you know, you have a connection to. In some I did, right. And, 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 the, and the country right. itself, you have a connection to. And Absolutely. I can tell, I, I knew it. I mean, of course, your name's Rousseau, and I had a, I had an idea, but I but right. it, if I didn't know your name, I would know that you had a connection. The the yeah. love of it it really pours through, and um, we have is. to talk about Viviana. And I don't give any any uh, giveaways because I want everybody. Okay. to read it. I don't do that at all. But I have to say, like, even when I look back at your other books, you tend to take these women that are in a place that women are not. Anybody supposed to be, you know, besides giving, making children, but, you know, right. babies, Absolutely. and you give them a voice and you give them an opinion and, and they, you know, and so I was wondering, for like, better or for worse, for better or for worse, but it's, <laughs> but it's real. I felt like she was real, you know? And I was like, did you have anybody that you made her out? Like, did you have anyone in your research? Did you find a woman? that was like her, or is she just all you, basically? <laughs> um, she's just all me, basically. She really is me. Yeah. In fact, every one of the women in Da Vinci's Disciples are based on a real woman in my life. Um. And the concept for it all was I was, I had a really horrific marriage by a very dangerous man let's mm -hmm. just put it that way right and the divorce proceedings lasted seven years mm. and at certain points i thought i just can't go on with this anymore yeah. and if it wasn't for this group of women around me i don't think i could have gone on and it brought into distinct clarity when women are bound and when women have each other's back it's a tighter thing than men will ever experience right however unfortunately women can also be extraordinarily catty mm -hmm. and be the first ones to break off and start talking about you here and talking about you there and so what I wanted to do with these women was to show, yes, there can be a little bit of that, but if we put all that down and if we work together, we could accomplish a great deal that we have. I mean, when you look at it, here's America, one of the newest countries, and we've yet to put a woman in the most important seat. Where other countries, including countries where women are not as valued as highly, supposedly, uh, they've been prime ministers and presidents for years, for decades. Yes. And, yes. and I think that's in part because we're not uniting ourselves as much as we need to. And so that's what this book, the whole trilogy, is an, an homage to women and their bonds of friendship. Yeah, and I'm on a fa – there's a Facebook group where the divorced women – then I interviewed the woman that runs it, right? She wrote a book and, you know. Oh. And, um, and even that, like, she's really trying to get this group of women to, like, empower each other. And she's having to delete people left and right of women putting down, like, well, I didn't do that and I didn't do that instead of saying, right. what did I do? And that's, you know – so much more. And I was thinking the other day, it was kind of funny because she has me thinking about my divorce in all different ways. But um, right. somebody posted, like, I made it five years. And I looked back, I was like, I've made it five years. Like, I never thought. And why do we feel? I don't think they feel that way. I don't think men walk around going, you know what? I've made this five. I, I really don't. I think it's us because we're the ones that gave the children. We're the ones that tried to hold the family together. It's a matriarchal. Absolutely. And it's, Italy is matriarchal. 
And they, they are very much. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, and that's very what I much. loved about it. It's like it's a very much a matriarchal society in, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not back then as much or whatever, but it did become very matriarchal. And, you know, and here it's like we're fighting for our mate. We're like you know, holding on to everything right. we can. <laughs> right. Well, I think I did mention something about that in the second book when Da Vinci is talking with Lorenzo de' Medici, mm -hmm. Il, Man Il Magnifico, and he's trying to convince yes. Lorenzo of something, and Lorenzo says, what will they, the men think, and Leonardo says something like, they'll think whatever their wives tell them to think, and so... I think that was very much true even back then. The women couldn't step up and be seen as the decision makers. and But behind the scenes, they were, you know, I've watched my, my grandmothers. They were still doing it. <laughs> yes. they, they really were. They really were. And um, so, yeah, I think they, they were a, a matriarch society even back then it was just on again just behind closed doors behind closed doors right and, yeah and i loved my my favorite part of the book too was when um they're trying to decide whether they're going to do this competition and mm -hmm. viviana viviana or viviana i, don't know, I always viviana say, viviana in yeah. my pennsylvania dutch brain it's viviana but <laughs> right <laughs> viviana i love when you know they were like okay it's either all together or we're not and she was just kind of like i didn't say that you know right and and at first i was like taking it back but then i was like but we have to like she had to she had to do it for her just like she did you know, and then they had to, you know, they had to decide if they were going to go with her or not. And, and sometimes it has to be that way because for her to not just because one other person exactly. can't, how can we do that? How is that progress? It's not. It's not. Exactly. And that, that was the turning point. And for a while there, I wasn't sure if I was going to have some drop out mm. and make that part of it. But when I started looking at the third book, which I'm literally surrounded by finishing <laughs> up right this as we speak, um, I thought it, it just, I, I'm watching my words because I don't want to give anything know, away too. from the third book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to circle it like a shark. Um, I just thought it would, things would play better if I did not have them drop out in the second. Yeah. For them to ultimately decide together to come out of the closet. Right. Because that's basically what the second book is about. Exactly. So yeah. when you were writing Leonardo's voice, you know, mm -hmm. and so you had to do all kinds of research on him. I mean, at least that is available for the mo for some part of it. But, you know, did you find him easy to understand or was it really difficult to, like, find his – because – Here's what I was thinking is that if anybody's going to agree to this, it would have been him because he was such a forward thinking guy. Like he wasn't that, you know, exactly. Backward. So it was easy to, to understand that he would support this and help. Of them, course. You know, of course. Right. Um, his voice did come easy to me when the trilogy starts off. He's his glory is still very much in its infancy infancy. Right. So I got to write the Leonardo that has rarely been written about. The before he was Leonardo. Be right. Before yeah. the Mona Lisa, before the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to read about him as a child, his childhood experiences, his journey to become the Leonardo. And I kind of extrapolated as to, I think life beat him down in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. and, and these books catch him before that moment. Right. And so I liked that. There is still the wisdom of Leonardo, which I relate to, to a great extent. Um, but he was still young and he was not quite as beaten down as he ended up 
being to a certain extent. I mean, he, he ended up leaving Italy. He died in France in uh, one of the palaces of Francois the First because he never got his real due diligence by his fellow Italians until after he passed. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't study um, Leonardo da Vinci in that way. You don't, you just don't, you know, you get no. to see, you know, when I was even teaching it to my sons, um, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's like, he's done all this stuff. You're just trying to teach them like everything. And they're like, wow, he even did that. Like, wow, wow. This, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. just kind of who he is. Like he, he did a lot just besides paint, you know? So it he was, did a great deal. Yeah. He's that's very why important. in the list of characters, I don't list him as an artist. I list him as a polymath. Yeah. which is a genius in more than one um, discipline. And that is exactly what he was. Right. Like even think, was about, just, think about science without him, you know, think about it's you know. impossible. Right. It's really impossible. Yeah. In fact, um, at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, they just had an exhibit where they took his drawings of, tanks, though they didn't call them that, and of flying machines and of mm. all these different things that he sketched out. Right. And they actually made them and they all worked. Right. And that was way before anybody's thinking. You had know? ever thought of any of it. Yeah. Right. It was fascinating. It was just wonderful. Oh. So he knew what he was doing. He was, he was gifted with knowledge for a purpose, no doubt. Well, I am so happy that you wrote these because, like I said, I I haven't even ever read a historical fiction about this area. I really think that you are, like, one of, I'm sure maybe there's somebody out there, I don't know. But I mean, in this day and time, I feel like you are the person. And, and I learned so much, and I connected with these women so much. I love Viviana, and, you know, I loved her as a single mom with the boys because I have the boy, you know, the two, my two right, sisters, right. that, and, and yeah. you have that, and, like, I, I yeah. you know. I, there was one line that you had in there, something about, um, I would do any, this might've been in the first book, actually. Um, I would do anything, anything to keep their love. Like that is the most yes. important thing, you know? Right. And I don't know that our children get that at this particular, but that's just that, that embody. I was like, it hit me. I was like, that is exactly how I feel. Like, yes, I get that, you know? Yeah. It's almost yes. like we don't speak it, but it's there, you know? Right, right. And I'm not sure, you know, as boys, if they'll ever feel that way. I think they will. I think I raised them right. But I think there's a lot of men who, yeah, they're good fathers, but they wouldn't give everything up for the life of their child. I, You know, there are just some, i cut off my arms and legs if I had to. right. You know, yeah, uh, exactly. Like we just, and that had to come across in the book because what she was doing was bound to affect their lives sooner or later. So she had to think about it long and hard to make the decision. Right. Yeah. All right. So, are you a painter? I am kind of. Mm -hmm. I try. I don't do that well. You know but a lot about too. it. You know, a lot. I said you have a lot of knowledge about it. Like I do because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I research. So if my publisher gives me a year to produce a book, I'll take nine months and it'll be all research. And then I'll write the book in three months. Wow. So I do much more research than I do writing because I just immerse myself so completely I know where I want my stories to take me. And then when I merge the two in my head, it just starts flying off the page. For my very first book, I learned how to fence. Um, for my second book, I learned how to blow glass because it's about the glassmakers in Venice. My third book, I learned how to shoot a bow and arrow, and I love that so much. I actually have my own. <laughs> And I do it on an amateur basis now. That's awesome. Um, my fourth book, I learned how to dagger fight, which also came in useful in these books. 
Um, and then for these books, I started taking painting more seriously. I took lessons and yeah, I really get into it a bit obsessively. Yes. But so but that's what makes such a good book. And, and I find that with historical fiction authors, not that novelists uh, per se don't have research because of course they have a certain level, but with sure. historical fiction, it's another level of, and I am a researcher too. Like I like to research, but, but I use you guys, like I don't, I'm not the one out there, but I, I read the books that research and, right. and write the stories and everything. And that's my way of researching. And that's what I would, you know, if I were to ever become a writer, like historical fiction would definitely, be, and that's my yeah. favorite to read. It's, you know, it's awesome. Yeah. So. My first actual words published was short horror fiction. I, that's right. I did see that on your, that's right. I was like, <laughs> that's crazy. And I don't read horror. I mean, I, I don't, it's not a thing. Not I don't even, even watch Stephen King. <laughs> oh no, I don't watch the movies, but Stephen King really had me. Yeah. And I think that's when I started out, but I could tell that the voice my writer's voice wasn't coming naturally on the page. Good. It, and yeah. And, and when I started writing historical fiction, I thought, yeah, okay, that's what I'm supposed to sound like. Yeah. And so that's when it started. Yeah. Well, I can't but I did. I started with horror. I'm so excited. I will be, you, you know, I'll be on, on Amazon order, pre-ordering that book. But for everybody yeah. who wants to read about Leonardo da Vinci and is interested in this time era, this is, this is the book. This is the trilogy to read. And um, I love it so much, Donna. You are awesome. Thank you so much for talking okay. to me. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> All right. You I have a great day. It. We'll talk soon. Okay. Thanks, thanks. so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.